uh, Professor Jerem Bars over at Covenant Seminary, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dick Kies, and some of the things that I've been reading uh, at, at his request. I have a, a new definition of apologetics, and um, I'm just pleased that he's here to sort of share with you some of the things that I've been learning from him. Um, he's actually the director of the Francis Schaeffer Institute here in St. Louis, and we'll talk more about that, but um, Mark, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to them about your time at Labrie, sure. or to talk about Labrie at all, and I was hoping that we could start there. Could you tell Absolutely. them what Labrie is all about and your time there? Sure. A mic. Just, just as a starting place, how many of you have heard about Labrie? Does that mean anything to any of you? Okay, a few folks. Great. For most of us, that's like, what? A, what's a Labrie, right? Is that a cheese? Is that, what is it? Uh, the word Labrie is French. Uh, it's a French word that means shelter. And Labri, the Labri communities are places of intellectual shelter around the world. Labri began in the 1950s in Switzerland. It spread to other points in Europe. Uh, there are now Labris in Boston, Massachusetts, Rochester, Minnesota, and in Vancouver, Canada. So North America has three Labris, as well as Asia and Australia. Uh, and so on. There's about a dozen Labri communities uh, in the world today. Uh, Labri, as I mentioned, uh, is an intellectual shelter. It's a place where anybody, Christian, non-Christian, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, uh, whomever, can come and safely and with integrity explore the claims of the Christian faith. So Labri is really a community committed to Christian apologetics. It's a place where the leadership and the staff live together in a community, open their homes to whomever the Lord chooses to bring. That's our prayer every day, that the Lord would bring the people of his choice. And those individuals come typically for a couple of weeks or for a couple of months, and they live with us in our homes and in the homes of Labrie staff and basically pursue uh, answers to their questions. These questions could be biblical, philosophical, scientific, moral, cultural, personal, uh, therapeutic, whatever. So I and my wife spent uh, seven years living and working uh, in one of those communities, actually in two of those communities, we served in Boston uh, and then later on uh, in Vancouver, Canada. We still have uh, involvement with Labrie, so we lecture for them and uh, go up and participate at various times of the year. But uh, if you're enjoying base camp, uh, then you may want to just put in the back of your mental file cabinet the possibility of exploring Labrie. It's kind of like base camps uh, in, in a different setting. Um, it's base camp maybe on steroids, if you will. If you can believe that, you're already doing so much here, I know. But it's a wonderful community. And it's not just the pursuit of ideas, but it really is kind of a holistic community where relationships um, and life together um, inform and give shape to the discussion. So some of you may have questions about that a little bit. That's perfectly fine. But that's what Labrie Fellowship is. And there are a number of them around the world. And they are communities committed to Christian apologetics. It's really a wonderful thing. We don't have... Uh, a lot of those communities. Thank you for the description, Mark. Um, so, great segue. We're going to talk about cultural apologetics, but before we do that, uh, more broadly, more generally speaking, um, when we say the word apologetics, what comes to your mind? What would you like for us to think about when we use the term? Good, thank you. I'd be curious, just as a, maybe just for a second, when I say apologetics, what do you link immediately to that word? So let's do a very quick association. I say apologetics, you say? Defense of the faith. Defense of the faith. You say? Yeah, the Same thing, you say? Um, are, uh, arguments. Arguments. Reasonable defense. Reasonable defense, okay. So lots of etymology here. You're giving me synonyms. The word apologetics does mean defense of the faith. Uh, the word literally actually means to give a word back, uh, to reply, okay? When you think about replying, when you think about defending your faith, what else comes immediately to mind? What do you associate with defending the faith? Good, bad, indifferent? Go ahead. 
debating. What else? Proof, evidence. Anyone want to have another shot here? Okay. Now, notice all these things are verbal, right? Uh, that's important. We're giving a word back. We've got something to say for the question askers in our life. But one of the things I would like us to understand is that apologetics is never merely verbal. Uh, if we go back to 1 Peter 3.15, it's kind of the... Uh, the classic location to think about Christian apologetics, always be ready to give an answer or a defense, to give a word back for the faith that you believe, right? The context, biblically, is a fairly ordinary collection of God's people, of believing men and women who have been dispersed, who are being persecuted. And if we look at 1 Peter 3.15 in larger context, their testimony includes their life together. It includes their daily conduct, their belief and their behavior. So apologetics is not just a verbal repertoire. It's not just a verbal joust. It is, has to do with our character and our conduct. Now, when we think of apologetics, typically, and when we read books by apologists and take lectures, we don't always get that flavor equally represented. We tend to get a heavy emphasis on the fine-tuning of arguments, on logical structures, on the amassing of various evidences that we would give in reply to the man or the woman in front of us. Now, let me be really clear. All of that is a really important part of apologetics. So we're not jettisoning those things, but we're only doing half our job. We also need to keep in mind the quality of our lives, our personal commitment to Jesus Christ. And we, need to, we, we know this because that same verse, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you, is prefaced by the words, set Christ as Lord. Peter's reaching back to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah actually, and he's wanting to establish a foundation of faith and of trust and of personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Here's the little secret. You can't do Christian apologetics without being a Christian, without having a commitment to Jesus Christ. At the other end of the verse, Peter tells us how to do apologetics with gentleness and respect. These are the qualities of the Christian apologist. So often... We have a focus in apologetics on the verbal, on the propositional, on the logical, all very helpful. But sometimes what falls into eclipse is the character that you and I are to possess and to cultivate, the dependency on Jesus Christ that is front and center for Peter. So apologetics is defending the faith, but it also includes our Christian testimony our Christian walk as well as our Christian talk. Thank you for that definition. And every time I hear it, I'm more and more convicted personally. Um, so moving on, now that we have a more robust definition of apologetics, Mark, um, when we use the term culture, mm. uh, what comes to mind? What would you like for us to understand as we use that term? Yeah, the, the word culture is actually a very complex term. Um, today, in particular, in the departments of sociology and anthropology, universities you go to, uh, it's a very much a debated word. Um, the word itself, culture, comes from the Latin, cultura, uh, has its origin in another Latin word, colere. Basically, originally, the language had to do with tilling. With, uh, with attending to, husbandry. Uh, it had to do with, uh, it was a farm image, if you will, an agricultural image. So well, that seems a long way from where we are. Not really, over time, the idea of tilling the earth, of cultivating the soil, of attending to the animals that the farmer kept became a metaphor that was applied to other things that we do. So culture has to do with the work of our hands generally what we make, and it includes the life of the imagination, what we can think up and imagine, 
and then it's kind of a reflexive term. It's not just what we make, but what does what we make make of us? So for example, culture has to do with um, fashion and the arts, architecture and the sciences, um, has to do with music, um, all kinds of the holidays, festivals, how we express ourselves in all the domains of life. And once we uh, invent, manufacture, produce all the artifacts of life, once we give ourselves to certain beliefs, to certain fashions, to certain artistic expressions, to certain philosophies, what do those things in turn do to us? They do for us in terms of making life a little more palatable, making life a little more fun, right? Um, but they also do something to us. They shift the way that we view the world and the way we relate to the world. So culture is a big word. It's complex. It's all encompassing. It takes into account not just the trip to the art gallery, not just high culture, as we sometimes think of it, but all of the complex activities, artifacts, beliefs, um, and the ways we relate to one another and to this world. So culture is really hard to wrap our minds around. But it's an important word because all of us live in cultured lives. None of us step outside, fully outside, the culture we're a part of. It's very important that we grasp that all of us are enculturated beings. We participate in culture, we shape the culture, and the culture we participate in shapes us. It's kind of like the fishbowl. Uh, it's the water that the fish is in. Culture is what we swim and move and have our being in. And that means we must, it's critical, that we become more and more aware of that water and what it's doing to us. Um, having defined apologetics and now having defined uh, culture, let's put the two terms together. Talk to us about cultural apologetics, um, what it is, but also mm. what it's not. Yeah, good. So by now, you're probably getting a picture um, that we're operating at a very broad level. Uh, that, that's important to grasp. Uh, in the history of apologetics, and in our own kind of modern, late modern period, when we think of apologetics, as indeed your own answers revealed, apologetics tends to get shrunken down. Apologetics tends to be reduced to the verbal and to certain strategies of argumentation. So when we think of apologetics, we typically think of, can you prove the Bible is true? How do you know there's God? Um, what are the rules of logic and of argument, rhetoric and so forth? What about suffering and evil? Now again, I'm interested, as you should be, in all of those things. So this is a, this is a story of addition, not of subtraction. We're not taking away those things. But it's really important that we understand that for many individuals, apologetics is a very small domain, a very predictable realm of certain questions, of certain points of argument or debate. A lot of apologetics, I think a little sadly, is largely intramural. That means it has to do with certain apologists critiquing other Christian apologists. Uh, it doesn't even reach our non-Christian friends or our university circle or our employees or our families who don't believe. Uh, it's sad to say, but if you look at all the books published on apologetics in the last, take a hundred years, uh, a ridiculous percentage is intramural. Christians critiquing each other, telling each other how to do apologetics, what not to do and so forth. Now again, iron sharpens iron, we can learn from one another, there is some place for that. But in the modern period, we've often forgotten that apologetics is broad and rich and deep. And so that the label cultural apologetics is meant uh, as a reminder that the apologetic task of the Christian, the range of issues, 
the potential number of objections or questions or concerns is as broad and as large as culture is itself. It's not just what about suffering and evil. It's not about the resurrection only or can you prove the Bible versus the Quran. It has to do with things like commercialization, pluralism, migration. It has to do with issues of, of economics and environment. In other words, if you think of your circle of non-Christian friends and you think of some of the questions they have asked you or some of the objections they have to Christian faith, yes, they may touch on some traditional concerns. Certainly, existence of God and problem of evil. But frequently, we have so concentrated on a certain set of apologetic questions that we now find ourselves unprepared for what's of real interest and relevance and concern for our friends. Many of our friends are asking us about sexuality. Many of our friends are asking us, what do we think about being gay or lesbian or transgendered? Many of our friends are raising questions about the conduct of the Christian church over the centuries that we've been around. We think we have the moral high ground. They think we do not. Most of our non-Christian friends believe that we've surrendered the moral high ground by our exclusive beliefs, by our hypocrisy, by our being outdated when it comes to some of the issues and questions of the day, by our withdrawal from culture and so on. So cultural apologetics is really asking us to pay attention to the full range of issues that are up for debate today. Now, I know this is a long answer, but let me take this in a different direction and I'll give the mic back to, to Jeremy. It's not just the range of objections, concerns, or questions. It also has to do with the context of belief and disbelief. A lot of traditional apologetics has been very concerned about logic and rhetoric and argument structures. We've been very committed to a certain idea of what is true and right and good that we've sometimes imagined that we can repeat the answers of the past, that we can simply retrieve what the Puritans said or the Reformers said or the Church Fathers said. And because those answers have stood the test of time within the Christian community, so we sometimes imagine that we can just take those answers and repeat them back to the culture today. See, people have always believed this way. See, for hundreds of years, rational people have thought like this. What we're discovering is, in our own moment of time, is that those answers lack traction. They do not have the appeal. That a different notion of truth and moral goodness is being entertained. And so we need to pay far more attention to the context in which belief and disbelief come to us. So cultural apologetics is very interested in what time is it? What's going on now? What are the particular pressure points or cross currents that give shape to the way that people believe and disbelieve? People may even ask familiar questions, but they ask them for unfamiliar reasons. They're not looking for uh, uh, the old answer. Let me give you one practical example. Um, take the problem of suffering and evil, which really is a perennial issue. Much of apologetics uh, pays attention to kind of the logical problem of evil. Wants to say that it's not illogical to believe in a good God who is all-powerful and simultaneously permits evil. Very important. Need to attend to that. Increasingly today, what I find people being asked is, is what we might think about as kind of a, the, more, the moral side of that problem or the collateral side 
uh, why did this happen to me? Or why is it happening in such a disproportionate way to this individual or this community of people? We've put all our eggs in the first basket and we're not doing terribly well uh, at answering the second or the shadow side to that question. Others come with a very personal existential crisis. It's not about logic. It's not about a particularly fine-tuned argument. You know, sometimes in reality, the most powerful answer to the problem of evil, particularly in its experiential form, is silence and an arm around the shoulder and a commitment to being present. But for some of us, we think of that as a cop-out. We don't think of that as a part of our apologetic repertoire. That's really sad. And we've seen that in one form uh, or another again and again, how sometimes we imagine that what's most needful um, is a strong word of reply, immediate, clear. Um, often, I think, where the spirit works most is through gentle, patient actions. Uh, we've seen that in our own lives in, in other ways. Another story that, I, that Jeremy knows has to do with a young woman who my wife and I uh, really felt a burden to minister to and to serve. And she worked in a local shop, um, just in a lunch, a sandwich shop. And we would go in, we would pray for her and pray for her and, and try to connect her. Didn't know her name, didn't have any real access to her. But we just felt burdened to do this and we did it for months. And we came in after several months of eating in the same lunch place, week in, week out, ordering, the, you know, trying to make eye contact or just trying to, uh, in some way that wasn't too creepy, just to say, hey, we're really interested in you and we'd like to get to know you. And uh, she left that employment. And we thought that was weird. God gave us a burden. And we really, we were beginning to hear things about her story that said it was difficult. Long story short, a couple months later, we bumped into her in a coffee shop and she, she came over to me and she said, I remember you. You used to come into this shop each week and can I sit and talk with you? I said, sure, of course. And she said, you know, um, I don't know you, she said to us, but I know I can talk to you. You, used to, you treated your wife so well. Um, you treated your kids so well. My dad was so absent from my life. I, they fought, they bickered. We had, I, I left home when I was so young. Can I talk to you? So here we were thinking that God would give us a, a dramatic opportunity and a direct word to say. And what he gave us was this circuitous uh, route in which she simply, what she was observing us. She was drawing and deducing something of our character. And that was what led her to come and to ask. And I just want to say that is part and parcel of apologetics. Choose a gospel, follow Jesus around the pages, and watch whom he encounters and who encounters him, and how seldom he's got a developed philosophical argument, but how often, out of his own character, out of his own attentiveness to others, he's in that place and in that moment to answer questions. So what we're trying to do in cultural apologetics is to enlarge the tent, to make room for today's ever-expanding set of questions. And we're wanting to take the good and the lasting answers of the generations and apply them and tailor them to the particular issues of today. So once again, not a subtraction story, not taking away from all that we're learning and reading, but adding this other dimension to it. Very good. Um, as a matter of fact, it was so good. <laughs> you answered a couple of the questions that we had uh, discussed earlier. Oh dear. Um, so, but how about this? Let's uh, let's drill down a little deeper. Yeah. So we talked about the uh, uh, the cultural waters yeah. that we are swimming in, and I, I sometimes think of this as uh, almost a missionary posture, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've got friends; they bought they purchased one way tickets to Tokyo, mm -hmm. but before going. They had to train, right? They had yep. to ask, what's the language of the culture? What's their uh, posture towards Christians or Christianity? What are some of the taboos of the culture? How can I be okay. sure not to offend accidentally? Yep. So let's talk maybe uh, along those lines. Good. Like, what would you say are some things that students need to think about when uh, thinking about uh, our current cultural moment? What are the, the big questions and questions underneath the questions that you've observed? Yeah, good, thank you. 
Um, very, very important. I, I'm going to touch that missionary posture, but let me say one thing in advance that ties in. Um, you, you just heard me make um, uh, a plea that we're not um, subtracting anything. Let me offer another caution, make another plea. Sometimes when people hear about cultural apologetics, they go, oh, fantastic. It's all about the culture now. I get, to, I get to play, I get to watch movies, I get to uh, take in all kinds of stuff and, and in the name of doing apologetics, right? <laughs> Culture trumps, um, biblical discernment, commitment to truth. Um, if you're hearing me suggest anything like that, let me say, stop it. Stop <laughs> now. Put the brakes on hard. So what we're, what we're wanting to do is to understand we are still, as cultural apologists, deeply committed to scripture. We are actually still and simultaneously biblical apologists. We've been given something to say, something to offer our unbelieving friends, something that calls us to a standard of living and relating to the world, right? So we're not pulling back on that. Cultural apologetics is saying in order for the gospel to be heard well, in order for the confusion and the disbelief to be dispelled, we are going to have to do the, the missionary work of understanding what's causing the confusion. Why are people so disenchanted with Jesus? Why is it that when you go to school and you say to your friends, had a fantastic Sunday, went to both services, did youth group on Saturday, fantastic. That Why are they not lining up to follow you next weekend? We want to know why. What keeps them from Jesus? Now, we might assume, well, we're smarter than they are. We worked it out rationally. We've got better arguments than them. But actually, that's never a biblical diagnosis, right? According to the Bible, our problem is not that we have more knowledge and they have less. The problem is ethical, not epistemological. We have hearts that are rebellious. We love to distort reality. We attribute to this world a meaning that suits our purposes, fits our agenda, accredits our pathway in the world. So we need to take seriously what is it? What is this worldview? What is this philosophy? What is this alternate commitment that my friends have that looms so large so as to eclipse Jesus? Now, missionaries, as Jeremy has rightly pointed out, for decades, for generations, have given themselves to this work. Language training, cultural understanding, learning the customs, the rituals, the traditions, learning how to conduct themselves in a different setting, looking for bridges, ways that we might share ideas. Uh, if a missionary went to uh, Japan uh, or to Nigeria or to somewhere as far away and as crazy as Australia, where I'm from, <laughs> and all they said was, let me tell you how we do it in America, or let me tell you how you've got it wrong, um, how successful do you think they'd be? How popular would they be? I see head shaking. We're more and more attuned to that problem, right? Now, in the Western world, after generations of having a kind of a very kind of uh, privileged advantage position, we're recognizing in our world that there are other ways to live well. There are other, there are benefits and there are complexities to other societies and language systems and ways of thinking. And we're discovering that our Western moment, because of our own cultural sin and rebellion and pride, is perhaps on the wane. And we're seeing the rise of Asia and of Africa and of South America. And it's exciting to see what God will do through his, his brothers and sisters, his believers in those countries. But for us, apologetics now is a cross-cultural reality. We have to learn a new language. We have to learn new images, new metaphors. We have to understand customs and habits, holidays and celebrations. We are having to learn in fresh ways to go into places that are unfamiliar and with deep integrity and with deep commitment to scripture, 
how do we translate the message? How do we live in a different environment? What is there to affirm and to acknowledge as being beautiful and good and God-honoring that perhaps we've missed out on? And what is there that we have to draw attention to in the context of relationship and say, this is not compatible with biblical teaching. This is a different cultural expression, but underneath is a commitment to a viewpoint, to a value that is profoundly unbiblical. How do we have that conversation? In our own day, even here in North America, we're beginning to see that something as user-friendly and as attractive as the American dream is actually not biblically compatible. The, the shape of the American dream in the 21st century is at loggerheads with so much of New Testament Christianity. The individualism of our day, the consumerism of our moment, our, our uh, tendency to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and all kinds of therapies, these can be helpful in their place, but they can take on a life of their own. And we tend to default to all kinds of things instead of looking to the one who made us. Now, we don't often think of consumerism or of uh, therapy uh, or even of drugs and alcohol as having an apologetic significance. We've been blind to these everyday realities. Uh, marriage in the 21st century, our sexual conduct matters more than ever. My wife and I will be married 20 years in December and all of a sudden, thank you. <laughs> Didn't expect that, but uh, I'll, I'll take it. That's uh, God's grace. Anyone who would marry me for 20 years is a, a <laughs> wonderful uh, example of God's uh, persevering grace. But here, here's the point, right? Many of us, particularly in earlier generations, took marriage for granted. Some of us still tend to take marriage for granted. We have mum and dad in a stable home we're provided for. Of course, some of us have entered into that very painful, that very difficult experience of marriages separating. And we know firsthand how painful, how difficult, debilitating it is when marriages don't hold together. But what all of us are like are now stepping into is the apologetic reality of marriage. That I don't get married to maintain a traditional norm. I don't get married to maintain any kind of financial or tax benefit. Uh, I'm not getting married for just for some romantic notion, but as a deeply biblical covenantal idea in which God will continue to sanctify me through the very difficult reality of marriage. And guess what? My wife and I find more and more that our non-Christian neighbours ask us about our marriage more than they ask us about philosophical reasons for being a Christian or biblical reasons why we do go to church on Sunday. So all of a sudden, the ordinary Christian practices, marriage, sexual chastity, even things like prayer and church going, have a very profound apologetic weight into our culture. So like missionaries, like travelers to a foreign culture, cultural apologetics is asking us to do our homework, to be aware, to pay attention to the questions. Let's not neglect or forget those. But what's going on behind those questions? Why are people interested in X and not in Y? How can I express myself and explain biblical truth in images, metaphors and practices that make sense to others who are not in our Christian circle. Uh, so, you know, young people in this room, students, they're listening to you and they think to themselves, you know, that's great for Mark Ryan, maybe for, you know, other folks in the room, but how can I do that? Mm. How can I be better at cultural apologetics? So just practically, real practical, practical nuts and bolts. How can we get better at this, Mark? Sure. It's an important question. One of the dangers of broadening out the tent, one of the dangers of making apologetics larger is that it feels even more overwhelming, right? Um, so we want to be careful there. But here's the good news. To be a cultural apologist is not difficult insofar as you and, and your generation are doing many of the things 
that are necessary that some of us kind of older guys are having to play catch up on. So really practical. First thing, pay attention to what your peers are into. What are, what are your classmates? What are your siblings? What are your friendships? What are they doing? What do they talk about? What's engaging their imaginations? If you can answer that question, you're already well on the way. What's captured their imagination? What's constraining the way in which they view the world? Answer those two questions and you are well placed to speak to that individual. A second, very easy, be deliberate. When you go into a new setting, when you watch a film, uh, play a new video game, uh, listen to a new uh, track on your iTunes, uh, don't just enjoy it. Ask yourself, why is this popular now? What else is like this song or this movie? In other words, what's the recurrent themes? If you can begin to answer some of those questions, you will find yourself beginning to understand the mindset of your friends and the cultural moment you're a part of. Here's something else very, very practical. Um, as you move into upper end, of, uh, you know, as you move into college and beyond, um, be deliberate about reading the newspaper or choose some good news outlets online. Subscribe to a journal or a magazine. Um, doesn't have to be super academic, doesn't have to be very expensive, but begin to process the news and the events. Ask yourself, what is of repeat interest to this moment of time? What are the themes, the issues? Ask yourself, why this, why now? Has this occurred before? What's new about this? What's not so new? Um, by simply being deliberate and engaging with certain resources, you will be surprised at how well you'll begin to navigate the culture. Now again, this is not culture for culture's sake. Okay? Think of yourself as a ship, you know, uh, and think of the ship, the bow of the ship, plowing through uh, stormy seas. Those stormy seas are the culture that you and I are a part of. Changing, blustery, threatening to kind of uh, scuttle us. We've got to be wise, we've got to be deliberate, stay on the ship, right? Okay, listen to the captain. But you need to understand the weather forecast, uh, how deep is the ocean, which way is the current facing, same in the culture. What's going on here? What is repeating again and again and again at the popular level, at the news broadcast, at the academic level? Simple steps of paying attention, asking questions, to some degree friendly interrogation of your peers. Why are you into this? I like this too, but I'm curious. Why are you into this song, this film, this whatever? To the degree that you ask those questions and engage, you will be fitted to begin to position the words that you wish to offer, the answers you wish to give, and you'll live with a new degree of deliberateness, and that will be blessed and rewarded, I promise you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Mark, with uh, regard to cultural apologetics, who are some of the uh, men and women who have uh, shaped you, influenced you, impacted you, and who should we be paying attention to or reading? I've had, I had the privilege, uh, obviously, working in a context for a number of years. So uh, really, um, at the forefront, I think, of cultural apologetics really is the Labrie community. So people like, starting with Francis Schaeffer, that some of you may have read, who in some ways coined the term um, and was deliberate about doing cultural apologetics, down to Dick Kyes. Um, Os Guinness, I think, is clearly um, today's most... Um, well-respected and consistent cultural apologist. Um, so I, those guys have been very uh, involved in my life and um, Jerem Bars as well, um, Andrew Fellows, um, Nancy Piercy who had a, a, a long-term Labrie stay. She is one of the most astute cultural apologists today. Uh, her works are very helpful. Um, but I also think, I also think really in the history of cultural apologetics, 
We have to think of C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, J.B. Phillips. Um, uh, these British authors really paid a lot of attention to the ways in which European culture was changing. And so as much as they've been claimed by all schools of apologetics, traditional, classical, evidential, so on, they're cultural apologists in the sense that they very rarely ever offer an argument without paying attention to the underlying social context. They're very willing to adapt language and very willing to speak to a particular audience in one way and another audience in a different way. Um, I, I think um, other good examples um, of cultural apologetics, it's still the minority, sadly, I think, but I, I, I think of um, um, somebody like, I'm trying to think of a good example, there's few and far between. Um, her name is slipping uh, from my mind. Um, Amy Orr Ewing, there you go. She is uh, a fabulous apologist in Oxford. Uh, Amy Orr Ewing is uh, best known as kind of a more evidentialist apologetic. She tackles a lot of very traditional issues, a uh, very gifted debater. Uh, she's probably my favorite contemporary apologist, but again, very attuned to cultural context and to different audiences. Ravi Zacharias, I think, is very good uh, in those ways. Um, there's still not enough of us, quite frankly, uh, paying significant attention to the culture. Uh, a lot of our best and most well-named apologists, and God bless them all, we need them, uh, still are not always attuned to what's happening in the culture in the same way. So we tend to be fewer, but um, I encourage you, read some Oz Guinness, read some Nancy Piercy, read some Amy or Ewing, these are all current voices. Um, who are really doing a good job at interpreting the culture and using that knowledge to offer and facilitate apologetic discourse. Uh, Dick Kyes writes very fine, smaller books, Jerem Bars as well. Um, there are some good works out there.